Good evening, Stratford. It's a pleasure to be here virtually to tell you about warping space and time. As you can see from the subtitle, I'm talking about the science fiction, well, maybe, the science fact, and a little bit about the science fiction of black holes. So I'll be doing a very brief history uh, and then looking at the science fact, which is most of this talk, and then just a tiny bit on the science fiction at the end. And then I'll be looking to the future. So let's just make sure we're all on the same page regarding a black hole, a region of space from which nothing, not even light, can escape. And a lot of people seem to think that a black hole is a reasonably recent concept, but actually, if you go back to the original idea, it's probably earlier than you think. It goes back to 1783. The Reverend John Mitchell, if I can paraphrase him, he said, if you take a sphere, the same density as the sun, make it 500 times bigger, all light emitted from such a body would be made to return toward it by its gravity. In other words, you can have an object that's so massive, light cannot escape. And in the 1800s, the idea of such so-called dark stars was largely ignored. So although it was postulated back in the 1700s, it was forgotten about until a lot more recently. I'm not going to discuss the contributions of each of these people regarding the understanding of black holes. I put uh, names and dates for anybody that wants to Google them later and chase up the contributions of these individuals. Perhaps the most obvious one is Einstein. In 1950 he published his General Theory of Relativity and that was picked up by a number of individuals who used that theory and calculated what would happen if you had a very compact object. And a number of them came to the same conclusion that very odd things will happen if you take a large mass and compress it to a small volume. A volume with a radius that's now become known as the Schwarzschild radius, you get odd effects like the, the escape velocity becomes the speed of light and rather oddly, time appears to stand still. So for a while, these objects, these hypothetical objects, were called frozen stars because time becomes frozen at this point at which the escape velocity reaches the velocity of light. So I'm going to talk about various aspects to help us understand black holes. And those aspects I've colour coded to try and make it clear which pieces of the jigsaw we're putting together. I'm going to spend a few slides talking about what we mean by escape velocity. And then we'll have a little think about general relativity. Don't worry, no maths. Then we'll have a think about stars and galaxies and how black holes might form. And finally, we'll think about how to detect gravity. So each of those pieces of the jigsaw we need to get a, a good handle on black holes. You could argue it doesn't really matter in which order we take those four ideas. But I'm going to take them in the order I've just indicated, starting with escape velocity. And for this talk and for handouts that I can make available to you electronically afterwards, I'm going to keep that icon in the top left corner with the particular piece of the jigsaw colour coded to remind us which particular aspect we are considering for each slide in the presentation. So escape velocity. The velocity at the surface of a body, a body how fast do you have to throw something for it to escape that body? If I'm sitting on the surface of the Earth, how, how quickly do I have to throw an object, let's ignore air resistance, in order for it to leave the, the surface, leave the Earth completely and escape from its gravity? Well, the escape velocity of any object, let's just assume we're talking about spherical objects like moons or planets or stars or something like that, the escape velocity only depends on the ratio of the mass to the radius of the object. In other words, the radius of the surface we're standing on. It doesn't depend on anything else, just the mass of the object we're standing on and the radius of the object we're standing on. That determines the escape velocity. And I'm not going to go through the maths of how we calculate it, but if we were to calculate it for various objects, we would find, for instance, the escape velocity for the moon is about two kilometers per second, or about 5,000 miles an hour in old money. The escape velocity from the Earth is about 11 kilometers per second, mainly because the Earth is so much more massive. 
It's got a larger radius, which would of course reduce the escape velocity because it's mass divided by radius, but the larger mass of the Earth wins out, so it has a larger escape velocity, 25,000 miles an hour. So when the Apollo astronauts wanted to go to the moon, they had to have a rocket to get them up to about 25,000 miles an hour to escape the gravity of the Earth and then uh, go to the moon. If we have a look at the escape velocity from the Sun, not really advisable, but we can do the calculation anyway, we find to escape from the surface of the Sun, we would need an escape velocity of 600 kilometers per second, or more than a million miles an hour. That's, again, mainly because of the larger mass. Yes, it's got a larger radius, but the mass is much larger. And although 600 kilometers per second sounds like a ludicrously high number, remember it's only a tiny fraction of the speed of light, less than 1% of the speed of light. And we can do a thought experiment. We can say, well, the escape velocity depends on the mass divided by the radius. So let's just ask ourselves, what would happen if we took the sun and simply compressed it to a smaller volume? In other words, we keep all of the mass that's inside the sun and simply put it in a smaller sphere. And we can work out then what would happen to the escape velocity, which is plotted vertically on this graph, as a function of how much we compress the sun. So the actual radius of the sun and the actual escape velocity are indicated by that yellow dot in the bottom right hand corner. But if we keep the mass the same and reduce the radius, the escape velocity depends on mass divided by radius. So if we reduce the radius, we increase the escape velocity. So if we were to compress the sun to a radius of 30,000 kilometers, the escape velocity would go up to 3,000 kilometers per second. And similarly, if we compress it to 3,000 kilometers, it goes up again. If we were to compress the sun to the size of, well, roughly speaking, the size of England, then the escape velocity would be 30,000 kilometers per second. If we compress the sun until it's the size of a big city, well, it would be 100,000 kilometers per second. And finally, if somehow we could compress the mass of the sun into a sphere of radius three kilometers, then the escape velocity would reach the velocity of light. And at that point, nothing could escape from that region of space because nothing can go faster than light in a vacuum. So that particular point there, the three kilometer limit, if you like, is called the Schwarzschild radius. And we talk, at a, we talk about an event horizon, a sort of one way membrane. In other words, things can fall into the black hole, but nothing can escape because the escape velocity has now reached the velocity of light. So we've done this thought experiment and said if we take the sun we would need to compress it to three kilometers to make a black hole. But we can also do a thought experiment and say well what would happen if we started with a different mass? What if we start with the mass of the earth? Well then we would have to compress the mass of the earth into a much smaller sphere. It would have to be no bigger than about a marble a radius of order centimetres or so, in order to make that mass a black hole. If we started with the mass of the moon, we'd have to compress it smaller than a grain of sand in order to generate a black hole. And if we took a mass, just an arbitrary mass, let's say the mass of Mount Everest, we would have to compress that to the size approximately of an atom in order to make that object a black hole. Now, of course, we have no way of figuring out how to do that. There is no technology available that would allow us to compress mass to that sort of size. We think it's possible for stars to be compressed under gravity until they are black holes. We have no way of figuring out how to do it with the mass of Mount Everest or the mass of the moon, for instance. Just because we don't know how to do it doesn't mean it's impossible. So let's have a think about the second piece of the jigsaw, general relativity. Well, Einstein came up with this wonderful equation, g equals eight pi t. We're not gonna deal with what it means other than to say the left-hand side of the equation deals with the geometry of space, or strictly speaking, space-time, space and time. And the right-hand side tells us about how much, how much mass and how much energy there is in space-time or in the universe, if you prefer. 
And the maths that Einstein came up with is sometimes more prosaically described as, well, mass and space are related, and mass tells space how to curve, and space tells mass how to move. Now, the idea of curved space is something that, of course, is a little bit tricky to get your head around, because you tend to think of space as just the gap in between stuff. But you have to think of space more like more like a jelly rather than simply the absence of anything. If you think about it as a jelly in which all of the mass of the universe is plonked, then you can think about that jelly changing shape and distorting depending on the nature of mass that's around it. But what do we mean by curved space? It's difficult to imagine because we are living in a three-dimensional world and it's difficult to imagine that three-dimensional world bending into another dimension, which is why we tend to always use analogies and say, well, just think of the universe as if it was two-dimensional. Then we can imagine that two dimensions curving into a third dimension, just like we can take a piece of two-dimensional paper and imagine it curving into a third dimension. But our human brains are rather limited, and generally speaking, we can't imagine what it looks like to take three-dimensional space and bend it into a fourth dimension, because we are not used to thinking that way. We tend to think only in three dimensions, not in four dimensions. So it's difficult to imagine, which is why we always resort to having analogies. What if space was two-dimensional, like a flat piece of paper or a flat rubber sheet? Then we can imagine the presence of mass distorting that, and if we distort it in the extreme sense with a black hole, we get the equivalent of a funnel, if you like, or a plug hole, if you want to think of it that way. And that's why we always tend to imagine black holes as being a funnel or a plug hole. Strictly speaking, they aren't, but that's the closest we can get to imagining them simply because of our limited imagination. So what does general relativity predict, apart from the existence of black holes based on what people have done with Einstein's equations? Well, general relativity has predicted a number of things, including the precession of the orbit of Mercury. As Mercury goes round the Sun, it goes round in an ellipse, but it doesn't cover its own track over and over again. The ellipse of the orbit of Mercury slowly processes around, and the point of closest approach to the Sun, the perihelion, slowly marches its way around the orbit. This procession is very slow, it takes centuries before you can see any real effect, but Newtonian physics was only able to explain most of the procession. Ninety-something percent of the procession was explained by Newtonian mechanics. But that last little bit, it was only when general relativity came along that the precise value of the procession of Mercury was explained, and it was considered one of the great achievements of general relativity that it could explain what Newtonian mechanics could not explain. Another breakthrough was in uh, 1919, an eclipse of the Sun allowed stars close to the surface of the Sun in terms of our line of sight to be viewed, because of course without an eclipse the Sun is too bright to see any stars in the neighbourhood. But when an eclipse took place, the positions of stars, whose starlight, of course, has got to us by grazing the surface of the sun, the positions of those stars was accurately measured, and it was found that the positions of those stars was slightly distorted because the starlight hadn't taken a direct straight line to us. It had curved slightly as it passed the sun because the mass of the sun had distorted, or if you like, curved space around it. It had warped the space around the Sun. So there's another reason why we believe general relativity to be correct. It made two predictions which turned out to be correct. Rather more weird than simply mass distorts space or curves space is that mass actually distorts time as well. That's an even more difficult thing to get your head around. Time slows down in a gravitational field, according to general relativity. But although it was rather odd, this was again proved by taking atomic clocks onto an aircraft, flying them at different heights, in other words, different distances 
from the centre of the Earth and hence in different gravitational fields. And it was shown that, yes, indeed, time runs at different rates depending on where you are in a gravitational field. This is actually quite important because, for instance, uh, the GPS satellites, they are moving, and so special relativity is important for working out how fast the clocks are running. But if they are at slightly different heights above the surface of the Earth, then they're in slightly gra different gravitational fields. And so we have to take into account the fact that different GPS satellites might be experiencing different gravitational fields, and hence their atomic clocks might be running at slightly different speeds. And you need the synchronization of atomic clocks in order to give you GPS accuracy of, for instance, less than a meter. If you allowed the clocks to drift, then your accuracy of your GPS positioning wouldn't be meters, it could be hundreds of meters or even kilometers if you didn't correct for relativistic effects. So we really do believe what Einstein had to say. One of the predictions that Einstein made, which was considered even more bizarre at the time, was that large gravitating objects, large masses, especially masses in motion, so for instance, to take an example, one black hole orbiting around another, two very large massive objects close to each other, orbiting each other, they would produce distortions of space and time that would ripple out from the source. They would produce so-called gravitational waves. As those waves pass through an object, the object will be distorted. And we can represent that in this little animation. If we imagine a gravitational wave passing through a cylinder with a circular cross-section, you can see the circular cross-section gets distorted. And if you take one dimension, it gets stretched, while the other dimension gets squeezed, and then vice versa, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. As the gravitational wave passes through this cylinder, the various measurements perpendicular to the wave passing through the cylinder, they get stretched and expanded and compressed. Nowhere near as much as this animation would have us believe, because here the stretching effect has been exaggerated enormously in order that we can see it. We can see stretching and compressing by a, an amount of many tens of percent. But the actual variation that we would expect, for instance, from a distant black hole producing gravitational waves passing through the Earth, we would expect the effect not to be 10% or 20%, as this animation might indicate, but the effect is going to be more like one part in 10 to the power 20. It's going to be an absolutely minute effect. So it was long considered just an academic curiosity, because it was assumed that there is no way we would ever have the technology to measure distances to an accuracy of one part in 10 to the 20. We would never be able to measure things separating or coming together on that sort of spatial scale. So although these were predicted 100 years ago, they were basically shelved until relatively recently. And I'll return to that in a little while. The third piece of the jigsaw is stars and galaxies. How do we think black holes actually form in the first place? Well, one of the ways that we think it happens is from the collapse of the core of a very massive star, a star much more massive than our sun. So when the fuel runs out in our sun, the star is not, to, not going to collapse in a supernova and generate a black hole. Our sun will have a, a little more... Uh, dignified death. But a very massive star, more than perhaps 10 times the mass of our sun, when the fuel eventually runs out and the radiation from the core, from the thermonuclear fusion in the core of the star, is no longer able to support the huge gravitational forces pulling the star together, that's when the core collapses. And a rebound effect as the core collapses basically blows the whole star to pieces. This picture here is obviously just a rather fanciful artist's impression of what might happen to a planet that's a little bit too close to a supernova when it goes off. But according to our understanding of stellar evolution, we think a black hole is a natural consequence of a, of a very massive star coming to the end of its life. 
Anything getting too close to a black hole could experience tidal forces that could ultimately rip it to shreds. So here a star is getting too close to a black hole and the material is now funneling into the black hole. But just like if you've got a bath full of water and you pull the plug out, the water doesn't go down the plug hole instantly. It tends to circulate around the plug hole, waiting its turn to go down the plug hole itself. And that's pretty much what happens when matter is trying to fall into a black hole. You end up with a circulating disk. All of the matter is now heated up by friction of the matter circulating around the black hole. And so the so-called accretion disk around the black hole gets very hot. It's also possible for the black hole to generate jets via a mechanism that we don't fully understand, it is possible for some of the energy to come out from of the vicinity of the black hole in jets that are aligned with its rotation. So we know that material getting close to a black hole can be ripped apart because of the very large gravitational gradients, the so-called tidal forces. And we know that accretion disks can form. We have now seen some of them. The idea of anything getting too close to a black hole being pulled apart is sometimes popularly known as spaghettification or the noodle effect. In other words, if you were to get too close to a black hole, as you approach the black hole, if you went, for instance, feet first, your feet would feel a lot stronger gravitational pull than your head and hence you would be stretched out. Larger black holes, the effect isn't quite so dramatic, but for a black hole with a mass similar to our sun, we would expect this to happen. Larger black holes exist other than ones that are made by single stars. If we look at what's going on in the center of our galaxy, we see a number of stars moving and they appear to be orbiting an object we can't see. The centre of the galaxy is this circle here, but there doesn't appear to be any object there. And yet stars appear to be thrown around by some force of gravity that is keeping these stars in orbit. This video is showing what happens to these stars over a period of quite a few years. But if you calculate what force is required to actually make the stars move that way, we find that there must be a very massive object at the centre of the Milky Way, and it must be very small, otherwise the stars would have collided with it. So this so-called supermassive black hole has that name because we think the mass of this object is some four million solar masses. This symbol on the right hand side, capital M, circle dot, is just shorthand for the mass of our sun. There's nothing unusual about the mass of our sun. It's just a more convenient unit than kilograms or tons. So the object at the center of our galaxy appears to have a mass of four million solar masses, much larger than you can account for from the death of one big star. How did that come to be? Well, that's a, a source of some interest amongst many astrophysicists and many telescopes around the world are looking at the centers of galaxies, trying to understand how these so-called supermassive black holes came to be. Just to give you an idea of scale, if we think of the solar system as a useful way of thinking about scale, if we just make that diagram a, a little bit fainter, we can think about how big that black hole must be because remember we know that escape velocity depends on mass divided by radius and so if we know the mass we know the radius of the black hole and we find that the radius of the black hole for the black hole at the center of the Milky Way is about that size relative to the size of our solar system. It's bigger than our sun but smaller than the orbit of Mercury. But if we think of other galaxies, which also have supermassive black holes at their centers, for instance, the Andromeda galaxy has a much bigger black hole for reasons we don't fully understand. The black hole at the center of Andromeda appears to be 250 million solar masses. So that's much bigger, not smaller than the orbit of Mercury, but something like the orbit of Jupiter, if it was placed at the same position as our sun. 
and the Sombrero Galaxy M104 has got a supermassive black hole with a mass of some 1 billion solar masses. So if we were to place that in our little map of the solar system, we would find it was larger than the orbit of Uranus. And uh, the largest supermassive black holes around, well, they would be too large for my diagram. They would be so large, they would basically swallow up the solar system if they were placed in that position. So understanding how these supermassive black holes get so large and understanding how they can grow to be so large apparently quite early on in the universe's evolution is an ongoing area of research because it seems like the size of supermassive black holes is related to the size of the galaxies in which they reside but understanding the chicken and egg which came first or did they evolve together is still not fully understood. Interestingly, relatively recently, the Hubble Space Telescope has looked at star clusters within our own galaxy, not in the centre of our galaxy, and it has found large, not necessarily supermassive, but large massive black holes at the core of this particular star cluster and apparently other star clusters. So it's not simply the case that galaxies containing billions of stars have supermassive black holes at the core. It looks like smaller cl star clusters also have massive black holes at the cores. And of course, we can ask the question, if we've now found some in this cluster, is it possible that all big star clusters have a black hole at the centre? Again, that is not yet known. Finally, the fourth piece of the jigsaw. Now that we've got an idea of what escape velocity is, what Einstein had to say about general relativity, how black holes might come to be from the death of stars and the existence of supermassive black holes at the centres of galaxies, we can now ask ourselves how it is that we detect their existence, detecting gravity. Well, remember I said that Einstein predicted the existence of gravitational waves. And despite the fact that they would be expected to produce tiny effects here on Earth, it was still considered scientifically viable to actually build something that could conceivably detect those tiny variations in distance. If we have some object like a black hole or a neutron star, something very massive, uh, moving very quickly. So these observatories were built, one of them in Hanford in Washington State, one of them in, Lu in uh, Livingston in Louisiana. These observatories are large L-shaped observatories, <coughs> excuse me, called LIGO, Laser Interferometry Gravitational Wave Observatory. Two of them were built simply because if you build one of them and then you claim to have seen gravitational waves, well, probably nobody will believe you because there will be so many other things that can make distances change by small amounts. The slightest vibration of the ground might produce something that looks a little bit like a gravitational wave. So you build two of them, separate them by thousands of kilometres, and then you look for some signal coming from out there in the cosmos. And if you see it in both detectors, then you haven't simply detected something very local to one or the other. So the idea is you take a laser, you split the laser and send it down two arms, the two arms of the L, and you bounce it off a mirror at the very end and bring it back again. And the other part of the laser is sent down the other arm, bounces off a mirror and comes back again. And remember what happens if a gravitational wave passes through an object? You would expect that object to distort and stretch in one direction and compress in the other. So if a gravitational wave passes through the LIGO observatory, then these two arms, which are nominally four kilometers in length, one of them will get ever so slightly longer and one will get ever so slightly shorter as the gravitational wave passes through and then vice versa. The long one will get shorter, the short one will get longer, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. Which means if you send a laser down these two arms, if the arms are the same length, the laser will arrive back in the centre there at the same time. 
but if one arm is a bit longer, it will take the laser pulse a little bit longer to get there and get back again. So there'll be a time difference of how long it takes to send the laser from this central station to the mirrors at the ends of the arms. That's what the mirrors look like at the ends of the arm. They're large pieces of quartz that are held in a suspension to try and isolate them from the ground around them. Remember, we don't want movements of the ground. We don't want tremors. We don't want footsteps. We don't want passing traffic to produce vibrations of the mirror that could possibly be confused with the variations that we're trying to measure because of gravitational waves. So having bounced off the mirrors, the light is brought back to the central observatory and a very complex piece of optics, an interferometer, is used to try and see whether or not the light from one arm is ever so slightly quicker to come back than the light from the other arm. And does it go backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards, which is what you'd expect if a gravitational wave was passing through the observatory. An amazing piece of technology. And what is really incredible is that after many, many, many years of development in 2016, they announced the fact that they had indeed seen a signal in both observatories that would indicate they'd seen the passage of a gravitational wave. So this is the signal uh, uh, seen at the Hanford Observatory and the signal seen at the Livingston Observatory. The scale here is how much did the lengths of the arms change and the strain is how much did they change divided by the length of the arm. It's roughly one part in 10 to the power 21. In other words, the strain, the change compared to the length is 10 to the minus 21. An absolutely phenomenally small variation. It's equivalent to saying the length of the arm from the where the laser is split to the mirror has changed by less than an atom, less than the nucleus of an atom, less than a proton, which is part of the nucleus of an atom. It's something like one thousandth of the size of a proton. It is a stupendously small distance that has been measured. And the reason they think they've got a gravitational is twofold, but one is the fact that the signal they see in one observatory matches the signal they see at the other observatory at approximately the same time. If we overlay these two signals, we find they look very similar. You might think that looks a little bit noisy and a little bit iffy, but these are showing the same sort of variation, um, a fraction of a millisecond apart. Notice that what they show is something that looks like almost nothing or so for a fraction of a second. Then the amplitude of the variation starts growing and the frequency is growing and then the signal disappears. Both observatories seen this, see this same characteristic signal. A gravitational wave that appears to be growing in amplitude, growing in frequency, getting faster and faster and faster, and then disappears. And they've interpreted that as being, well, what we think we're seeing is two black holes orbiting each other, so-called in-spiraling. As they get closer and closer and closer together, they go faster and faster and faster until they finally merge. And as they get closer together, the gravitational signal gets stronger. It gets a higher frequency because the two black holes themselves are going around each other, orbiting around each other faster and faster and faster. And finally, the two black holes merge together and the signal disappears. It's been calculated from the wiggles. The wiggles may not look very spectacular, but a, a theorist can take these wiggles and take the shape and take the change in amplitude and change in frequency and calculate what black holes must exist, what could they have been doing in order to explain this particular shape and structure to the signal we see here on Earth. And they calculated that what must have happened is a long way away, something of order one and a half billion light years away in a very distant galaxy, two black holes merged together. One of them was 29 solar masses. The other was 36 solar masses. 
and they merge together to produce a black hole, which is 62 solar masses. Those of you who are good at maths will realize that 29 plus 36 does not equal 62. The final black hole is three solar masses lighter than the individual black holes that merge together. Where did those three solar masses go? Well, those three solar masses were converted via, if you like, e equals mc squared into their energy equivalent. And those three solar masses generated the gravitational waves that radiated out from this galaxy over a billion light years away. And even though we're at that distance, we could still see the effect and see the gravitational wave with this tiny variation, thanks to the sensitivity of these amazing technological features of the LIGO observatories. If we remember the scales here, it's only a fraction of a second. It was simply too noisy. Whilst these two black holes were orbiting each other at some considerable distance, they weren't generating enough gravitational wave energy for us to see them. It was only in the last fraction of a second where they generated ripples in space-time that were big enough for us to observe. But think about how much energy was released in this tiny fraction of a second. In the tenth of a second or so of this particular scale that we can see here, but virtually all of this energy was released. Three solar masses were converted into energy and released in a tenth of a second. Think about what our sun is doing. Our sun is converting mass into energy. At the end of its 10 billion year lifetime, it will have converted about 1% of its mass into energy. So the sun is producing a huge amount of energy, but it's only converting 100th 1% of a solar mass into energy, and it's doing that over a time period of 10 billion years. This event converted three solar masses, 300 times as much, but it didn't do it over 10 billion years, it did it in a tenth of a second. So for this one tenth of a second, this particular event was probably producing more energy than every star in every galaxy in the observable universe. This event was outshining the rest of the observable universe for that tiny fraction of a second. That's how energetic this particular merger of these two black holes was. Now that we know it can be done, LIGO is being developed in other areas or the concept that produced LIGO, other countries are building their own interferometers, gravitational wave interferometers. And there are plans also to put one into space. Why limit yourself to having a laser that gets shone down arms that are kilometers in length, when what you could do is put satellites in space and then you can fire lasers between them and you've got almost no limit to the distance over which you can send the laser beams. And there are plans to build not an L-shaped observatory, but a large triangle with three, uh, three satellites and lasers bouncing between them. And you could have these satellites, in principle, a million kilometres apart. So you'd have much longer arms. And that would allow you to observe different types of gravitational waves. So LIGO is sensitive to waves with a period, as we've seen from the previous example, with a period of a fraction of a second or so. So it can detect the collisions of neutron stars or the collisions of black holes. But that doesn't happen very often. This idea of a so-called evolved laser interferometer space antenna or LISA or ELISA or ELISA, that will be sensitive to much longer wavelengths and longer periods. So instead of events that happen in a fraction of a second, it could be sensitive to gravitational events that happen over a period of seconds or minutes or hours. So it might be able to detect black holes within our own galaxy and possibly supermassive black holes in other galaxies, more than LIGO itself could measure. 
Who knows, it might also be able to detect the gravitational waves that surely must have come from the biggest creation of all, the creation of the universe, the Big Bang. You could argue that's the biggest singularity that you could conceive of, the biggest change of matter existing in space, the birth of space-time itself. Surely that should have sent ripples throughout the universe. Maybe it would be possible to see them if we build a large space-based gravitational wave interferometer. We can detect something about black holes because relatively recently the Event Horizon Telescope was put together. Not really one telescope, lots of telescopes working together as if they were one large telescope. So you can see here lots of telescopes spread around the world, Europe, America, even the South Pole. Put them together as an interferometer, you can effectively make a dish the size of the Earth. And that means that with a relatively small uh, wavelength of operation, with a dish, if you like, the size of the Earth, you can get very high resolution of distant objects. And that was used to get a view of the accretion disk around a supermassive black hole in the galaxy M87. So the black hole at the heart of M87 is called M87 star. So what we're looking at, the orange, is effectively the accretion disk. We're looking at radiation from matter that is circling around the black hole. We can't see the black hole itself. Any light that's trying to get out from this region is being bent by the gravity of the black hole. And so we have a shadow region inside which we cannot see what is going on. To give us an idea, we can sort of have a little simulation the accretion disk is probably a pancake like the rings of Saturn. But if we look at it from different angles, we realise from what from above it looks like a pancake, but seen from the side, it looks very odd. It looks very different from the rings of Saturn. Out here, it looks a little bit like what we would expect for a flat pancake. But the pancake at the back, notice that we can see the back of it because we can see over the top of the black hole. Light from the other side of this disk is bent by the black hole distorting space in its vicinity. Not only that, but we can see the underside of the ring at the same time because light from the top or light from the bottom of the, the accretion disk on the other side of the black hole is distorted, is bent by the black hole, and so we can see the top and the bottom simultaneously. And that is what we think we're looking at with this image of the, the black hole itself. It's brighter on one side than the other because as the material is going around the black hole, some of it is moving towards us, some of it is moving away from us, and there's a relativistic effect which changes the brightness of the material that we can expect to see. At the same time that they took data from M87, they also tried to do the same thing for the supermassive black hole at the centre of our own galaxy. Now that's a much smaller black hole, but it's a lot closer because of course the centre of our galaxy is much closer than the centre of a much more distant galaxy. So it's a smaller black hole, but it's closer and it just so happens it's a very similar size on the sky and so it was expected that we might be able to image that as well as image M87. It's a more tricky problem because in M87 material is circulating around the, uh, the, the black hole and the same is true of the accretion disk for our Milky Way, but being much smaller, it'll be orbiting much faster. So you can't really average out all the observations you make, for instance, over one night, because it might be that some of the features that we can see here in the accretion disk, maybe they would change over a period of hours. So it's a bit more tricky to actually analyse all the data for the Milky Way, but that was done, and sometime after the release of the data for M87, they released the data for this is what the accretion disk looks like for Sagittarius A star. In other words, the accretion disk around the black hole that's at the centre of our own galaxy. Again, it's not uniform in brightness. Different parts of the disk might be moving towards us. Quite why it seems to have three hotspots, I don't quite know. 
One thing we do have to bear in mind is the difference in scale. Remember I said that the Sagittarius A star is a lot smaller but a lot closer. If we attempt to put them on the same scale, we realise that the accretion disk of M87 star is huge compared to the solar system, for instance. That gives you an idea of how far Voyager has got so far. So the accretion disk is even bigger than that. And we would have to blow up the very, very centre of this to get an idea of how big the accretion disk of Sagittarius A star is. And you can see it here compared to the orbit of Mercury. So very large compared to the Sun's diameter, about the same as the orbit of Mercury. So the Event Horizon Telescope has basically shown us that, yes, the idea of an accretion disk around a black hole is not just hypothetical. These things do apparently exist. And now we have the technology to measure them. We should be able to learn more about how these accretion disks form. So we've looked at the science fact, we've looked at escape velocity, we've looked at general relativity. We've had to think about how stars and galaxies will produce massive black holes, even supermassive black holes. And we've seen that we can detect the existence of black holes both by looking at gravitational waves as well as using the Event Horizon Telescope, a radio telescope, to look at the accretion disk around a black hole. So we can now ask the question, now that we've got a reasonable grounding in what black holes are and how they behave, we can ask ourselves, well, does Hollywood ever get it right? I've picked three movies that happen to relate to black holes. These three movies, the first one is the Disney movie called The Black Hole. I'm not sure you remember it. It's quite old. It's got Ernest Borgnine. Uh, Anthony Perkins, Maximilian Schell, and that involves a uh, ship that goes to the event horizon of a black hole in order to study the black hole. And because time stands still at the event horizon, what they do is take the ship up to the event horizon. At that point, time stands still, so they simply put on the parking brake and sit there and observe the black hole and study it. That's the premise of the black hole. OK, the next film is Lost in Space. And here we have, towards the end of the film, the ship is trying to escape from a planet. We don't need to worry about the details of why, but the ship is pulling away from the planet and it seems to be pulling away from the planet quite happily. In other words, it appears to have escape velocity. But as it's escaping from the planet, the planet, for some reason or another, decides to collapse into a black hole. Again, we don't have to worry about the reason for that. Let's assume the planet forms a black hole. What happens next is, as the black hole forms, the ship suddenly realises it can't escape because it was pulling away from a planet, now it's pulling away from a black hole. So the ship gets sucked into the black hole. In the third film, Event Horizon, a ship is powered by an onboard black hole. We don't get all of the details of how, but apparently an onboard black hole is sufficient to give them the power to drive a starship. So there's three Hollywood scenarios. You go to the Event Horizon and you park. Or in the second one, a planet is not enough to pull the ship back, but a black hole is. And in the third one, a black hole powers a starship. Two of those are rubbish. One of them is plausible. I'll just, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands or a chat. I'm just going to give you a few seconds to think which two are rubbish and which one is actually plausible. OK, you might have had a thought of it. I'm not sure if you've done your own show of hands, but number one, the black hole ship parks next to the event horizon. No. Yes, time stands still at the event horizon of a black hole. Time stands still as seen by a distant observer. In other words, if you were to watch the ship going into the black hole, it would appear that it would be getting slower and slower and slower as it approached the event horizon of a black hole. You would never actually see it going into the black hole. But if you were on the ship itself, time would pass just as it always do did. 
It's only relative to a distant observer that time appears to slow down. So if you're on the ship and you go to the event horizon, you would go straight through the event horizon and get sucked into the black hole. There would be no opportunity to sit at the event horizon and put the handbrake on. So no, you can't do that. Number one is wrong. Lost in space. They're pulling away from the planet and then the mass of the planet gets concentrated to form a black hole. Well, I don't know how that would happen, but that doesn't matter. The point is, if you did that, would the ship suddenly get pulled backwards? Well, no, it wouldn't. Taking the mass and compressing it to a small space doesn't increase the gravitational field. If you think of the Earth going round the Sun, the Earth is kept in orbit by the gravitational pull from the Sun. If you were to take the Sun and compress it to a three kilometre sphere, the Sun would turn into a black hole. But it would still be the same mass at the same distance. So the Earth wouldn't give a damn. The Earth would still continue to orbit at the same distance because it would feel exactly the same gravitational force. Or if you prefer, space would be distorted in the vicinity of the Earth exactly as it would if the Sun was a large object or if the Sun was a small object. Just because you compress something doesn't make gravity stronger. Gravity is determined by mass and distance, not by density. So just because the planet decided to become a black hole does not mean the ship would then suddenly be pulled in. If it could escape in the first place, then it would escape even if the planet became a black hole. So the second one is rubbish as well. And of course, that means the third one is plausible. Yes, you can power a starship using a black hole if you want to. So... How would you get the energy? Well, for a black hole, if you have a mass of a black hole, let's say less than a kilogram, then of course not much energy is available because the most energy you could hope to get out would be E equals mc squared. And if you only had a kilogram to play with, then no matter what you did, it would be limited as to how much energy you could extract from the black hole by whatever means you had. If you have a really big black hole, a black hole with a mass more than that of Mount Everest, then Hawking radiation is very weak. Hawking radiation is the radiation that we think is emitted from all black holes. It's emitted from just outside the event horizon. It's not emitted from inside the black hole and escapes, because nothing can do that, but it's emitted from just outside the event horizon. Hawking proposed this, and most scientists agree that this is uh, a reasonable hypothesis. We haven't yet proved that Hawking radiation does exist. We can't observe it in black holes, but we do think that it does result from uh, the existence of black holes and the very strong gravitational field just outside a black hole will result in Hawking radiation. And Hawking worked out that Hawking radiation is very weak for very large objects, but gets stronger and stronger for smaller objects. So if the black hole is too small, we haven't got enough energy to play with. If the black hole is too large, Hawking radiation isn't very useful. But if we pick something in the middle, let's pick a black hole with a mass of, let's say, a million tons. Then we can calculate how much power there would be in the Hawking radiation that we would expect to be emitted from such a black hole. And it would be equivalent to the output of something like 100 million nuclear power stations. That's a fairly large amount of energy that you've got available to play with. And if you work out that the black hole emitted the equivalent energy of 100 million nuclear power stations, how long would the black hole last? Well, the black hole would last for about a century or so. So in principle, you could have enough energy to power a starship up to very high velocities, and you would have to replace your black hole perhaps every 50 or 60 or 70 years or so as it got uh, close to running out. So you'd have to pull in every once in a while to replenish your black hole, but there's nothing in the laws of physics that say you can't do that. I'm not sure quite how you would make sure your black hole stays in your engine room, but there's no reason why not. The size of the black hole you would need to do this, the size of a black hole which has a mass of about a million tons, it would be tiny. It would be smaller than an atom. 
So your engine room doesn't have to be very large. You just have to somehow capture or direct the Hawking radiation and use that to power your starship. So although that wasn't part of the premise of the, uh, the film, the Event Horizon, the idea of using a black hole to power a starship is perfectly OK. What about everything that Hollywood says about shortcuts through space? Well, a lot of science fiction rely on wormholes and hyperspace because otherwise it gets really boring if you have to take years or decades to get from one point in space to another point in space. So the idea of distorting space in some way that allows you to get a shortcut from one part of space to another part of space, that is pretty much a staple of science fiction. We've seen it in Stargate and Contact and Star Wars and Star Trek. Pretty much everybody has some way of taking a shortcut through space uh, so as not to make the stories really boring because they would take place over centuries rather than over minutes or hours or days or weeks. And if you can have a shortcut through space, doesn't that mean you can have shortcuts through time as well? Because it's strictly speaking space time that is distorted by the presence of matter. So if you can make a shortcut through space, doesn't that mean you can end up at a different time as well? And of course, the idea of time travel, again, has been a staple of science fiction for as long as people can remember. If you're of a particular age, you probably remember the time machine in the bottom left. Um, for more recent individuals, it's the top left or the bottom right that we think of as a time machine. But we have the problem, of course, if you go back in time and kill your grandfather, doesn't that give you a paradox? Well, it does. So even though there doesn't appear to be anything in the laws of physics that stop you traveling through time, there are all sorts of problems when you start thinking about what could happen. Hawking didn't like this idea of time travel, so he basically said, let's assume that there is a chronology protection conjecture. And it's a conjecture because this cannot be proved. He simply said he was more comfortable with the idea that there is such a thing as a chronology protection conjecture, which simply states that if it is possible to make a wormhole allowing time travel, then the wormhole will collapse before anything has time to travel through it. So you can't actually change the past because although in principle physics allows you to make a wormhole, actually you can't actually send anything through the wormhole that will make any material difference. So although this is purely a hypothesis, it's purely a conjecture, it is one way of keeping the universe safe for historians because you are unable to change history. There is a problem when we think about the universe on this scale. General relativity has been around for a hundred years and seems to work really well for massive objects like stars. Nothing so far has proved general relativity wrong for very massive objects. But we have another theory called quantum mechanics, which is another theory that's been around for a hundred years. And again, we have not found anything that proves quantum mechanics wrong and it works really well for tiny objects, like atoms, for instance. So if they're really massive, general relativity is what we use. If they're really small, quantum mechanics is what we use. But what if the object is massive and tiny? For instance, we've taken a very massive object and crushed it down to very small dimensions. Perhaps the center of a black hole is absolutely tiny, but absolutely massive. So it really looks like if we want to understand black holes, we need general relativity and we need quantum mechanics. In other words, we need to put these two theories together and we get quantum gravity. But what does quantum gravity look like? General relativity works. Quantum mechanics works. But general relativity and quantum mechanics are not good bedfellows. Nobody has yet managed to put them together and construct a theory of everything which takes everything in general relativity and everything in quantum mechanics into account. And that's really what we need if we want to understand the universe properly. So a lot of people have been working on various ways of thinking about 
a theory of everything, but so far, nothing. Even Einstein didn't get very far with it. Einstein was never really happy that quantum mechanics was the right description of the microscopic world, even though it appears to be as solid as general relativity. He spent most of his later years wrestling with the theory of everything, and as a result, it took its toll on Einstein. It turned a handsome young man that we see on the right into the Einstein that we all know and love in his later years. And he died not having completed his theory of everything. So if a genius like Einstein could not get his head around the problem of how you put general relativity and quantum mechanics together to understand black holes, what is it going to take? Maybe it'll be something unexpected that comes out of LIGO or possibly a space-based gravitational wave observatory like ELISA. Maybe some discoveries from one of those will point the way forward to allow us to get a better understanding of black holes. Thank you for listening.